Check one.
Thank you. The survival is improving, all death is declining, which is a good thing. A five-year survival of all cancer is 67, 66%. Lung cancer is 18, five-year survival. Compared to everybody else, 66 in average, we 18. Although I understand the graph is going down, we're doing better, we're doing something is working, but... We're far from average. we 18% five-year survival. We're far, far from average. So look at the number. This comes from the U.S., from Sears, um, and from the National Institute of Cancer. So lung cancer is number two of the new cases per year. But look at the estimate death. We are far, far above everybody else. Even breast cancer is number one. The, the death is like 40,000, we like 1,500, we like far above. You combine cold, prostate, colon, and, and breast together, you're not even close to lung cancer death. You combine the top three against us, we still beat them by far, which is a bad thing for lung cancer. we done something right, but we probably not good enough. So... We look at the pie chart just to make sure that we understand this. And then we see what the global picture of the lung cancer is. The breast cancer, um, it's all cancer. 
or other cancer is 50% here. Lung cancer is basically, death is 25% of everything, which is, to me is a huge number. Now, uh, this is a, a recent trend, and I'm glad that lung cancer is on the bottom, the trend of the new cases. We are on the negative side, which is good, but we have such a high mortality, that's why we're not having many much more new cases, but we are very high mortality cancer. So same, oops, same thing, this, but look at Canada's statistic, what the Canadian do in terms of when we, this is a problem, when we discover cancer, in lung cancer, majority of the cases that we found in non-small cell lung cancer, we had 50% of the cases we found them in stage four. We are already advanced stage by the time we pick them up. And stage one, it's a 20%, stage two and three are in between, but what is small cell is obviously is almost 70%. So we are bad. We pick lung cancer up at much later stage, and that is a problem. It is a big problem. You don't have the good treatment, then you pick them up late. That's why your mortality is up there. The five-year survival is very low that way. All the, this is a uh, BC, it's almost similar. I think this, that this uh, number excludes Quebec. Quebec is not on the list, I don't think. So Quebec is out. But I wouldn't imagine this much huge difference. So mostly are, we pick them up at the late stage across the country. That way. I think this is across the U.S. and Canada the same. It's almost globally. You look at the chart, they all look the same. So compare. So where we are in terms of we, we're not good in mortality compared to when we pick, when we first diagnose the patient, when we found them, where do we do? So lung cancer are stage four. Half of it, we are stage four. Colon, they are almost equal, 25, 25, 25, pretty much. Look at breast cancer. I don't know if we can read it. This is breast cancer. So breast cancer, the reason is they pick them up early. So they're number one, mortality is less. They, they pick this breast cancer mammogram screening, whatever screening program that they've done is right. They pick them up early, they get a good treatment, and then they get a good result. Colon is the same. The colon, colon screening is working and is effective, and you can see that mortality of them are much lower than us. We all know that even though we're screening and everything, non-smoker do get lung cancer too, keep in mind that all the screening, nails and trials and NLST, everything, we focus on high-risk patients. Then non-smoker is the one thing that kind of slipped through it. That's why just keep in mind there's a non-smoker, lung cancer exists, and majority of men adenocarcinoma, they are typically quiet and silent and they grow. So, Beside that, the trend of changing of histology of the lung cancer, this is quite an old study, but the trend continued the same way I show you the graph, that there are somehow there are changes of, of the trend of previously squamous cell carcinoma and uh, small cell are dominating cancer. But in the last 20 years or even 30 years, the histology have changed. The squamous cell is decreasing and decreasing adenocarcinoma is increasing. We are unsure why there's a big paradigm shifting of the types of the tumor. Maybe CT scan picking up early part of it. Maybe tobacco change. I think we believe mostly our tobacco must have changed something. That there's a big paradigm shift in terms of histology of the lung cancer. So we're not good in number. What can we do to improve? Um, what can we do? The number, we're working hard. Uh, what can we do? So we can reduce the lung cancer risk. There's a modifiable risk and there's non-modifiable genetic and those stuff. We can't. You, you get what you get. Smoking cessation is, is a key here. If you look at all the screening trials and everything, smoking cessation 
is one of the key factors that reduce all this uh, lung cancer mortality. Um, we have a lot of resources in our own practice. I'm trying to tell all my patients you better quit when you see here. You come here to have a CT screening, see nausea follow every year, but you don't quit smoking. What does it mean? I'm just watching your nausea, but you don't quit smoking. So smoking cessation is 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 real. I think we can't emphasize enough. There are um, ongoing trials in BCCA as well and VGH that we heavily have the nurse practitioner emphasize and follow all the lung cancer patients and calling them and try to get them to quit more aggressively than just a passive. Do you want to? And here and there, that one we try. So basically, patients come into my office at VCCA. If they have lung cancer, ask you want to participate in the trial, and then the nurse practitioner are going to go after these people, keep calling them, emphasize all this stuff. And we'll see how much this aggressive approach will make any difference or not. And so second thing that we can do is... Uh, we, we need to look at our colleagues in breast cancer, colon cancer, what do they do? Why do they pick these patients up early? Screening trials is important. So if you want to change the way the disease is, you have to pick them up early. So screening has been around for a long, long time. So nothing seemed to work until recently. There's something works. So with CT screening, X-ray screening has been around for over 20, 30 years. It has been failed to show any benefits. CT screening, uh, I will talk about NLST in a second. It, it won't be lung cancer to talk without NLST speaking, but I will show you. There's a biomarker. Uh, biomarker is nothing really come up to the blood. Breath test is show some convincing um, evidence, but it's not quite there yet. Basically, the electronic nose that you can just give a couple of blow, and then they detect some cancer smell, and then you should go for screening. It's starting from dark and sniff and smell cancer. Believe it or not, it's real. I've seen it. And so the dog can tell which piece of tissue is cancer and not. You can just give a little beagle, and then I've seen it in... In, in the lung cancer conference before, and then the, we try to do electronic nose. Um, there will be uh, clinical trials going in VCCA and VGH. We have the machine, so the trial will run in in the next year or two. Just so we even go to whether or not do we suck out the air from bronchoscopy as intense as it could be, would it increase this uh, thing? It, it will be. I think it's coming here. We have done a short run before, but it's coming. But I'm going to touch base about CT screening in the future. And Dr. Haig walked in. That's excellent <laughs> for CT screening. Um, anyway, so besides we, we pick them up early, then we need to make sure once we've seen them, uh, we can deal with it. Right? So if you think about all the screening trials is is just to see them and discover cancer earlier. But they're not the treatment. You know, you're going to end up with a lot of lead time bias if you don't do it right. You can screen, the, you have the best sensitive method that you can do. You see them, but you don't manage them right. It doesn't mean anything, really. You add on anxious to the patients, and you, you end up with a lead time bias big times. So I put this thing up here, up front in the slide here, just to say that the BC have, do have problems. We have wait list issues, delay diagnosis, delay referral. Those is an issues. So this is an old trials, but still worth to mention because although it has been out for a number of years, but we haven't even adopted here in, in Canada and in British Columbia. I'm not sure if Ontario have started it. There's recommendation there, but there's a lot of obstacle about this. The trials is excellent. There's decreased mortality by 20% compared CT versus uh, chest X-ray screening. So the number is excellent. The number is even better than breast cancer mammogram, actually. So just walk through this for the few, next few slides is who... Who do we screen and how does it work? So we screen people with 30-pack year smoking history, 55 years to 75 or above. This trial will run with the big trial, 54,000 patients 
randomized three years follow up low dose CT annually versus chest X ray. So, just to show you that they do three, uh, three year positive results on the uh, CT is a lot more than X ray on the CT screening. And at the end, if you look at the uh, mortality benefit, uh, low dose CT scan to split the curve. It, the benefit is real, the benefit is there. Now, I'm talking about CT, part of it is you've seen them, you think it is what it is. It's not just the CT screening that change the mortality, it's what you do after you see them actually make a difference, right? You, you pick them up, you screen from the big one, and you have to do it right. If you don't do it right, then, then you won't get the same result. That's a problem. And then if you look back in 1990s and 1980s screening trials and those things, they not only have just an X-ray that to detect the tumor at much bigger lesions than the technology of obtained diagnosis by biopsies. There's no CT-guided biopsies at that time. There's no sophisticated bronchoscopy. Their surgery was not VAX, and then mortality is different. So I believe that now we in the era when we have technology to do. Now, what I'm saying here, just once you pass all the CT scans screening, you found them, you see a significant amount of patient, number of patients go through these procedures. And these procedures make, at the end of the day, 20% come up with the CT plus these sections of the, the management is right. So I just put this one up just to show you they, they do have benefit and they have some harm coming with it too, although it's mostly a false alarm, mostly are leading to more invasive procedures. And those is for you who are participating in this screening trials or a program that can reduce all this harm or potential um, disadvantage of the screening. So what do we learn from NLST? Lung cancer is works. We know is lower the chance of dying from lung cancer. It's effective. If you've done it right, then it depends on how, who are at risk. If you scan the risk, high-risk patient, then likely you're going to get benefit. If you have a lot of medical mobility, you go through this, you're likely going to come out not so good. It depends on how you do um, the trade-off is to, you know, false alarm and a few things. The bottom line is this, what it tells us is ad hoc practice does not work. So we can't just look at the screening trials and, okay, good. I, I have my 60 years old, 30 pack year smoking history come to my clinic today. I'm going to do CT screening now. It doesn't work that way because... The following procedures and the timing of the follow-up, I'm not sure how we can get that exact what the trials is. Even if you want to do CT scan in six, in three months, let's say, and you send down the radiology, say, I want CT scan in three months. I'm not sure if you can get three months exact from the first scan that you have. Radiology can say, I don't know. Uh, the wait list is longer. And... If any delay happened, patient not showing up, or there's a result was done, nobody look at it, then you delay the whole process. And you annual, it kind of bad in the way in, in BC here, one year is, is a short term for the follow-up CT scan. If you want two CT scan and they pick up the result and get going, it's it tough because the booking CT is like three months at least, three, four months at least. If I write the requisition now and say I want CT now, then I got it in three months. If you want it in three months, you won't get it in six months. So those things come. Timing is an issue, right? So we, if we think about doing it here locally, this is your options. Um, I'm not promoting my own clinical trials or anything, but we do have BC lung cancer screening trials. It's run at VGS and BCCA. So ad hoc doing it does not work. Don't think about going up, set up your practice, and just now going to do it. It doesn't work. You need to have. You need to make sure that your protocol follow. If you look at NLST trials, they have a 
nurse to go after this patient. It's been three months. Your CT is booked. You're going to show up. We're going to resolve for you tomorrow. You're going to see respirology, pulmonology next week. This thing is going to get biopsies. Those are things need to go. So we do have lung cancer screening trials. If you come across any patient that you think they might benefit, they're interested, you can call this number or you can actually, there's a website. That we can search it and then we take emails and everything like that. So this is the way to go now. This leading to see this trial will go and will be the pivotal trial for British Columbia to see if MSP and if ministry will allow to do. I'm not even sure we have enough CT scan machine to do to cope with this number at the get-go. But at least the trials is going at the moment, still recruiting. So I think this is the way to go. Yes? How have they done? I mean, the, ca the cancer agency has done this trial, right? So this is more, it's less of a trial than an actual implementation of a screening program. Uh, kind of. Um, this trial, is, is a, the inclusion is different from NLST a little bit. This is more close to the, NLS, uh, to the Nielsen trials that, that just came out with the 26% mortality if better than NLST. This one is more closer to that. So we, got, we want to roll it out. The, we have proposed to MSP many times, and they no funding allowed. So we can even write CT now to do like CT screening. So we got the donor, we got uh, a number coming in here. This is the way to go. Also, we actually haven't tried, and we don't have, we haven't actually do the pathway coming through like an, an LST. Like if you have this at six months, can you see respirology the next week? Can you see thoracic surgery next week? Can you do this and this? We all wait list to see us is uh, shamely six months, four months, right? Unless it's urgent. So thoracic surgeon is the same, is, is, is a month at least. It's two months if you can get on operation table. And that is the key. It's not the day of the diagnosis that make the difference. The day of the treatment make different. I have some of that slide in here. Therefore, without this, without basically without support, you can, you're not going to get your patient to treatment the day of the treatment that the day matter the most. Otherwise, anything else you've seen before is lead time by us until you actually make the difference on the day of the treatment. And so is this different in that this is patient-initiated and all the other trials have been sort of doctor-initiated? And, and what you're doing here is patient-initiated, right? Um, the patient has to make the phone call uh, or no, the website. Or... It, it just, this one, it is. It's a clinical trials. But what happened after, once you enroll, once you, I book your CT scan, mm -hmm. we ensure that you do have the CT scan the way that the protocol said. If you do out in your, on your own, radiology may not agree with you that they will give you three yeah, months. And then I have some slides to show you what happened at St. Paul when we try to do it without having support, meaning nurse practitioners and coordinators. So now that slide coming in a few minutes. But um, anyway, so come back to the real world. So when they look like cancer, and how do you get this biopsy? In the real world, those are things that the ideal that we want in order to make us closer to the breast cancer people and the breast uh, and the colon statistics. So that's what we, I think screening is important. But once we found in the real world, we've seen the guy, ex-smoker, cough, coming in, show with the mask, what do we do? We have this mask. How do we get this proof? We, now this is the second phase after we screen, we see them. So we use uh, bronchoscopy. I talk about it nowadays. We are better than 20 years ago. This, this part of the, if you follow the patient from screening, you found them in 1990, you can't biopsy them. You don't have CT gutted biopsy. You just chop it out, and that's why your mortality is different. Now we can do the biopsies. I'm going to show you something that we do here. So once we see the lesion like that, I hope my video works. I showed this before. We have the navigation system that tell me what to do. It's a real-time simulating picture. That is a CT simulating that we do. We overlap them. The machine is real-time recognized. It's automatically moved. When I move my scope, the CT move and give me the pathway 
eventually we decided uh, medical student can do it too. You don't <laughs> because you just follow the line, I guess, and they put the tumor right onto the real screen, and now we see the tumor follow the line, and they just keep follow the line, and then this is what, we, what I call GPS system to do it. We got a CT boom, and then the tumor is simulated. I put the ultrasound probe into it, and then we start to exam. We don't have one here yet, but hopefully when we move to the new hospital, we will have one. This one is, is here in, in Vancouver, it's in, in BCCA. Um, you can see the tumor simulating. The ultrasound is on, and we see the tumor, and we take the biopsies. Right, so, so for this case, you see we, we got it. It got squamous cell carcinoma, and we move on. So this is how what happened after screening. You see the mass, you take the biopsies. So what about ground grass opacity lesions like this that's hard to see on the EBUS, adenocarcinoma in situ, or minimally invasive, or lipidic growth? So, and again, we have a different machine at BCCA that we can see all these ground grass opacity better because it's become important because CT screening is going to see a lot of ground grass opacity. You, if you see solid, say, hey, it's that easy. Then you can see a lot of this hazy ground grass that... Not sure what it is, but then we need a little bit something better than um, better than just the ultrasound. We call it OCT with autofluorescence OCT to so detect them to biopsy them better. So it's going with the same catheter, small catheter. I don't know, does it work? The file's big. Yeah, it doesn't work. Anyways, once we have that, basically this catheter put into the lung, you will see all is basically what I call optical biopsies. I don't want to replace pathologists, but it is optical biopsies. We can see very fine details of the airways and the tumor. In fact, this is the real case that we did at BCCA of the ground grass opacity. We can see lipidic growth of the tumor through the OCT. So we do optical biopsies, and we do have needles and instruments to do the biopsies when we see it. So we... Once a CT screening comes out, we're going to deal with a lot of GGO or ground gas capacity lesions. We need to make sure that we know how to handle them. So, move on to, um, I guess food is still not here, but nobody leaves. But it's not coming. Oh, a bit disappointed for the audience. Anyway, so um, staging. Staging is important, so staging accurately is important. So this is uh, the eight editions of staging just came out two years ago. We just start to adopt and move on with the staging. Why is it important? It's important because um, you can see the, the curve is split quite nicely if you stage them correctly and properly, then this graph is split them. I didn't put the sixth edition for, to compare, but they all blended. The line is so close together, but the F edition is really split the curve. They are involved just a T is T and M staging, so it's tumor and the lymph node involvement. So the lymph nodes um, is endobronchial ultrasound take over mediastinal staging by from the surgeon. So we do much more uh, accurate staging now. It becomes gold standard of biopsies when we. See the lymph node, we put a scope here, we take the biopsies of this. We even better than PET scan in terms of uh, staging. So comparison EBUS to the PET scan, the sensitivity specificity, we better. Now even the recommendation is to biopsy anything bigger than six millimeters, where the PET has a sensitivity kept around one centimeter. So we biopsy much smaller not lymph node. And that the facts of it, and I didn't put the study in here, but it's about 10% of the PET-negative uh, cancer will have a positive EBUS on the lymph node. And, and this 10%, I'm talking about changing staging, meaning upstage of patients, about uh, 3 to 4% of the negative PET could have an N3 disease. That mean you upstage them from stage 1 straight right up to the stage 3B almost. About 10% keep in mind, therefore, PET scan is good in terms of distant metastasis for mediastinal staging. 
they are not gold standard anymore. So eBus is still the way to go. So that move on quickly. So um, those are simple things like one tumor only, one tumor, a few lymph nodes. What if the lung is big and Pindal being exposed to the same cigarette smoking and carry the same genetic test? What about multiple lung lesions? How do we stage them? What, how do we manage them? What if patients have two tumors at the same time? What do we do? The second primary cancer, separate tumor in the same lobes, uh, GGO, and just like this, you have a two primary tumor, one here, one here. What do we do? It's like, is the patient's, how do we stage them? Is it a T4 or is this is a T2 of the T2? Those are some concern. Sometimes one half the solid here and one half the ground glass capacity here. Which one do we go? What if we have the big lobe, like adenocarcinoma, sometimes they show up like a consolidation, big consolidation like that. How do we stage them that way? Those are important. The bottom line is if you have multiple primary tumor, um, TNM on each, if you think they are separate tumor, they're not metastases, then benefit of the doubt, you stage them separately. If you if you have the lipidic growth, pick the big one, and that's going to be your T stage, followed by the N and the M. If you have mnemonic type of consolidation, unfortunately, you move up to T3, T4 right off the bat. And if it, they're typically involved with the subpuro area, then if you think it involved with the pura, they mostly are, then you're an M1 right off the bat that way. So... Treatment, um, surgery, chemo, radiation, targeted therapies, and immunotherapies. No other treatment better than screening, I think. Just pick them up early, deal with them, surgery is out. Why surgery is this important? So surgery is, no questions about this, is a survival of people with surgery, with no surgery, right? So what are, my point of this slide is, Every time you see patients with lung cancer, if you can do surgery, think, try hard, get them to do surgery because the result is substantially different. So try hard, try to do the surgery if you can. Um, guideline from the UK indicate that recommendations is, by the time you see the nodule, you think it's a cancer, uh, 62 days, from referral to the treatment. Like what I said, the day of the treatment matter. When you first see it, can you get them treated within two months, basically? Once you make the diagnosis, you have a month to go to have the treatment. Because the first day of the treatment matter. The first day of the diagnosis is giving patients the headaches. They just go home now, I have cancer. Yeah, but my radiologist told me two months ago that I have cancer. Look, look at his report, he says it's cancer. It doesn't gain anything to the patients. It's like, yeah, confirm cancer. But to us, it's moved something. Do we have, can, uh, where, where are we now in the 60 days, 30 days in British Columbia? Are we close? I'm going to skip. This is the, uh, our internal medicine resident who presented, Carlos is presenting this last, uh, just this year at the research day. It's a, Research that she do here at St. Paul, she review a CT scan, almost uh, 1,600 scans, and see what this has happened at St. Paul. We basically look at the database of the radiology, pick up all the CT scan of the chest that was done at St. Paul um, in 2014, and follow them what happened. is So we know that... Um, <clears throat> we have about 44% um, of... The case that's supposed to have action going, get it done, meaning get the resection, get biopsies, get the treatment. 70% of them are done within three months. By the way, a recommendation say two months. We 70% of us is 70 months, uh, of three months. And another 20% is more than three months. And almost 20% is over six months after your first CT scan was done, you already know it. By the time you act together, it's past six months. 
Leave alone 42% of these um, 59 cases coming here. Although radiologists say you should follow it up, only 60% of them get follow-up, and another 40% disappear. And 25% of them, this nodule fit flashner criteria that should have been indicated follow-up, didn't get mentioned on the interpretation at the bottom. It did mention in the, in the body context that you've got the nodules here and there, but the radiology didn't actually say you should follow it up, although it fit with the Fleshner guideline. And yet half of them lost follow-up altogether. So this answer Dr. Onrod's questions, if I do ad hoc program here at St. Paul, this is what happened. Basically, half a majority of them disappear. Even if on the best case that I have here is coming this way, this way, and this way, it's still small amount. Even if it is, it's still moderate, it's almost three months. It's not even close to recommendations of two months. Time matter for cancer, right? So therefore, this is kind of emphasized enough that the ad hoc thing does not work. Do it on your own in the clinic doesn't work. That's why we haven't done it. You say, oh, this analysis has been out for six years. We haven't done anything about it because we don't have infrastructure to support it this way. Anyways, I'm going to move on to same patients. Now we've got the biopsies. We have the treatment. Um, I sent it to pathology, and my pathology colleague is so far advanced, gave me the report. Oh, here this is what all this fancy, schmancy, your immunotherapy become positive. So it's not a lung cancer talk without talking about lung immunotherapies because it's, it, is a, it is a big uh, thing in world lung cancer in the last many, many years, in the last few years. In the last three years, has been the big, big topic about immunotherapies. So what is immunotherapies? Is immunotherapy is, the bottom line is, when uh, tumor is just present in, in our body, typically the tumor like to hide and the T cell doesn't recognize tumor is the enemy of us. That's how the tumor grows. So this is what PD-L1 is, a receptor that faking food the T cell so the T cell doesn't know it's a cancer. It, they thought it is normal. The drug can unlock this PDL1. So basically, PDL1 inhibitor just unlock it, expose the tumor to the, your own immune, and therefore your immune attack the tumor. Maybe that's what we think why, why um, some people have no cancer. Some people have cancer that no good explanation why you do, why you don't. Maybe your immuno is doing it this way. So, there are, at the moment, there are a few medications available. I'm not trying for you to read, but just to show you, there's um, nivolumab and pembrolizumab are the kind of two drugs that um, hit big in the market now. So, what is immunotherapies? Is basically you look at the tissues, the amount that you come in here. Pathologists will do staining of the tissue to see. How many, what percentage of the piece of this tissue has um, receptor of this? By having a dark scan here, brown scan, meaning you have more than 50%, you have less than 50%, you have some and you have nothing. Why does this matter? Because it, the drug is expensive, and a clinical trial decide to see if you have more receptor, you would you be better in terms of outcome. If you have some receptor, does it good enough? Or you have no receptor at all, does it good enough? Because when you take the biopsies of the tumor, we got tiny piece, literally it's like three millimeter piece of tumor that we sent to pathologists. And they try to decide, they, we, the tumor sometimes have necrosis, sometimes it's not always homogeneous of the tumor. We, we think it is, but it's not. So this is one of the clinical tri trials that came out um, a couple of years now. It's about pembrolizumab. It's Keynote 10. So basically, they enroll patients in here to receive different doses of pembrolizumab versus uh, conventional treatment, dox uh, doxotaxel. I'm going to show you what the graph is. 
basically patients who receive, uh, the top one is the, the uh, patient who have more than 50% of the PDL one The bottom one is all comers, or less than, um, even including less than 50% into it. But if you have the PDL one receptor more than 50%, your curve is definitely split better than conventional chemotherapies. So if you have a cancer, you have immunotherapy PDL one positive, your chance of responding to the treatment is higher. In look at the um, subgroup analysis for survival uh, analysis, unfortunately, people who have eGFR mutation does not respond well to the PDL one. It's almost now about five years ago, we all jump up and down. If you have eGFR positive, you you're good. You're good. You're in the good category. We have target therapy. It works. Now, so unsure now when the immunotherapy comes, say that you have eGFR positive, you don't do well with immunotherapies. And immunotherapy, does, the survival is better than eGFR now. So maybe having eGFR is not so much as good news sometimes. So immunotherapy doesn't come for free. Besides, it's very expensive. I think it's $200,000 per session, per, per round of the whole thing. But MSP is covering it at the moment. Um, it comes with a lot of autoimmune disease, hypothyroid, immunitis, and many other things. Basically, if you have autoimmune disease, anything that you see rheumatology for is almost out. SLE and everything, you, you can't be on immunotherapies. So just to show you, there's a few more trials that have the um, uh, involved with the PDL one in lung cancer. This one is uh, pembrolizumab compared to the conventional chemo as well. The curve is also split beautifully as well. So it shows in multiple clinical trials that it works. Another one is stage three lung cancer. Oh, sorry, devolizumab. Just to show you, but this one is placebo. Stage three lung cancer, you go in here, clinical trial, you take placebo or you take the drugs. So placebo is nothing practically, so it's better than placebo. But these trials um, randomized in two to one ratio. So majority of the patient do in the drugs trial and the placebo is on the only uh, small arm that way, but it do split the curve that way. So, who should be tested for PDL1? How common it is in PDL1? It's a lot more common than EGFR that we think. We all jump up and down with EGFR, but EGFR is only positive in less than 20%, and that is a lot for British Columbia is unique. We have more EGFR positive than the rest of the country by far. We have a lot more EGFR like we are close to 20%, but if you look at the U.S. and the rest of the country, they at 5 or 6%. They are much, much lower, but we, I guess we have more Asian populations around here. But PDL one is positive. If you have 50% positive, almost 30% of the cancer that we've seen. And if you have some positive, 66%, that's more than half of the lung cancer that you take the biopsy have PDL one positive. Why does matter? Um, this is uh, why does matter because the way we we um, obtain specimen is important. And again, I keep I can't emphasize enough that the data treatment does matter. Is you, if you take the um, specimen and is not adequate for PD one testing, then patient don't get treat. The oncology can't treat them. They just sit on it and send you back for the repeat biopsies until you have the good specimen for it because the treatment is so superior, so they're not going to put you on chemotherapies. So they'll wait. So now this is a waiting time happen. So the problem with the PDL one is it needs to get done at the um, sorry, it needs to get done with the specimen go to the formalin container. And that is a key here. That's not normal for respirologists when we take the biopsy, they go on to cytolite, and those things are not valuable. It's not good for the PDL1 testing at all. So you make the diagnosis, 
to send them for the treatment. They say, oops, your tissue is not good enough. You better go back and repeat the biopsies. That delay time. And, uh, and the testing for pd one take about a week. If you're lucky, maybe two weeks sometimes. So if we talk about 60-day period after your biopsies, the pathologist take two weeks, respirologist take two weeks, and GP take two or three weeks, and that we call fast in British Columbia. That is rushing, right? In real world, we six months, which is shamefully that way. But so that's why clinical trials need to be ongoing and infrastructure need to be support that way. So therefore, as a respirologist who's up front when you see the tumor, we know that 60% of the time of the patient gonna have pd one positive. If you think your patient's gonna need one, you have to do the biopsy right up front adequately and send them properly that way and have it in the pathology lab ready to go when the oncology asks. So this is how we do it. We basically put in a tea bag. We filter back that pathologist gave it. Dr. Walker gave it to me. We drop into the tea bag. The specimen will float up above the fluid below. The fluid below will be get fixed with satellite. The actual tissue will go into the formalin. They will keep it. Now, the good thing about pd one is different from EGFR. EGFR do have mutations. Once you treat them, they come back, they mutate. The tumor gene is different. But pd one never changed. You just need one tissue. One is proof, it's proof, it's done. Even though you treat them twice, three times, the pd one does not change. You just need one good tissue. Anyways, I come close to the last few slides here. So this is beside we screen them, we treat them, we talk to them. I think the other side that we don't talk much about in medicine is, is how the patient feel and those things. Those are important. We need to close to all the loop. This is anxiousness. This is actually this is a the elevator sticker in the BCCA that put this thing up. I saw and I like it. So every cancer Experience is different. Make sure that you give them enough support beside you make the diagnosis. Even though they come for CT screening, they, they walk, they go home with the thought that I have cancer because the doctor told me uh, I got a spot in my lung. They go home with no thinking they have cancer. So make sure that you have all the support. They are support um, available in British Columbia. So they are lungcancercanada.ca. You can go to the website. They have link. They have phone call. They have group support. Uh, cancer.ca in the, in the support section do have support for lung cancer as well. So this is something that you, if at BCCA or at the cancer clinic, then they are group support. They are readily available. But in here we don't. At least we can tell them you go to here and you can call this number. Sometimes that does help. I end my last slide without, I can't go without quit smoking sensation because I think this is one of the most important slides as well. So quit now. I try to make all my patients quit, but I try my best. But I guess we just have to work harder to get them quit. All right, this is 10 minutes left for the questions. Any questions? Where do PET scans fit in all this? And it would seem like if you're going to operate on someone, you'd want to know for sure that they didn't have mess. A PET scan would probably be useful. And if it is useful, then wouldn't that be a potential logjam place for getting people through the system? PET scan, um, it used to be all, all the patients who go to surgery need the PET scan for distant metastases. That's, Bottom line is, it used to be metastasis staging for proper staging. Now, bronchoscopy taking over. Regardless of what the PET scan result, then you will come back for to have a bronchoscopy. So PET scan is a little bit not as prom, but it's still very, everybody needs PET scan just to make sure there's no distant metastasis before they go in. On some occasion, we use PET scan to guide which nodule to biopsies when the multiple lung lesions show up and you're not sure which to biopsy, you do PET scans, 
biopsy the most uh, pet positive lesions, those kind of thing that way. Any other questions or comments? With regard to these <clears throat> markers on the tumors, do they uh, change over time uh, in these patients? Say, for example, the tumor reoccurred and, the, uh, and it was PDF1 negative. Uh, will, uh, can sort of the metastasis be positive and, and then respond to chemotherapy? That's a good question. If the PDL1 changed, the PDL1 itself doesn't change. So once you have, if you have the same site of the tumor that you treated with PDL1 and then recur did not respond anymore, the actual PDL1 receptor doesn't change. But EGFR do change. We do see EGFR mutations differently, that's for sure. The question is, if they pop up somewhere else, that is a question. Are we dealing with a second primary? Keep in mind, this is the same lung. We've seen many times that you have adenocarcinoma here and squamous cell carcinoma on the other side, and two different tumor, two different behavior. Then to your question is, if you biopsy the second tumor that show up in the lung on the other side or different spot, can they have different PDL1? The answer is probably yes, because they're different tumor. So not all can have the same tumor. But if it recurs at the same at the same spot, probably no. So far we believe there's no change in, in, in PDL1. And if it's the metastasis from, from, from the The metastasis carry the same uh, carry the same. So it, therefore we don't have to biopsy the primary site, we can biopsy um, any metal any site. So far, keep in mind immunotherapy is new to us in the last two year, in the last three years. So we're learning about it. Any other questions or comments? Oh, oh sir, Cam. Yeah. Okay. Question about the BC blood cancers. Oh. I have to, I still don't know because I'm still a bit unclear as to what the rules of the trial are. What if it comes back with a negative result? What do the patients who are strokers in BC say, or other provinces, other states now have screened your small trial, whatever? Like, we're not going to get 30,000 people in this trial. So I'm a bit unclear as to. I think that you got it correctly. The reason is that how this trial start is we went to ministry, BCCA, the Lung Cancer Tumor Board, write a letter to them. They're like, ah, no. But they say, no, it doesn't work. You have to prove it to me. It works here first because so many infrastructure here, as I say, it's not just a CT that they make the difference. CT is a first gate only. What we do after we found them matter. So we have to prove that we are capable of running this patient through this effectively before we can roll out all this trial program. Yes, if it come out bad, trouble. But that's why <laughs> it's like come out bad. We hope not. And then it's not quite trouble because I, I'm sure Stephen Lam and John Yi are running this show. They are good, and we try to make sure that we at least we, we expect to be better than NLST. But we don't know until it's actually come to, to the real data. If it come back negative, I wouldn't say we're going to be no to British Columbia. We're going to say, what's wrong with us? Do we have the unique types of patients? Just like EGFR, we have 20%. Nobody else has. Do we have the different unique, what, we can, what can we do to make it better for, for us locally in British Columbia rather than just follow that? I myself look at the U.S. It's a big trouble. Like chest guideline and many guidelines say you should do it. And how many hospitals do you have in the U.S.? How many of them have capability of doing what NLST does? Not many. But you look at this, it's only 14 sites of the big university and the big top-notch radiologists who read all this thing. I don't even know how U.S. is going to roll out in, in 10 years that this thing is going to be. They, they all do ad hoc thing. They, I think they're going to come out bad. But I, I don't know. If the big university you find when you're not, then you're a problem. 
that answer your question? <laughs> Any other comments or questions? No, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Your call will be disconnected. Emotional, <laughs> unemotional.